Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 97 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. There are few figures in history who capture the imagination quite like the medieval knight. He's the quintessential romantic figure on horseback, but being a knight in the Middle Ages actually meant a whole lot more than just wearing shining armor. Knights were expected to be expert horsemen, pious defenders of the church, responsible managers of property, courteous entertainers of ladies, reciters of poetry, military leaders, and also stone-cold killers. This week, I spoke with Christopher Gravett about the complex figure of the medieval knight. Chris is a former senior curator at the Royal Armouries Tower of London, who's consulted on films such as Braveheart and TV shows like the BBC's Ivanhoe. He's also the author of many books on knighthood and knights, with his latest book being a succinct and well-illustrated look at knighthood, simply called The Medieval Knight. Here's our conversation on knighthood, how a person got to be a knight, including moments in which people were actually forced to become knights, and what Chris thinks of knighthood in the media. Thank you, Chris, for joining us to talk about knights. Now, this is a topic that I think everybody is excited about. When they think about the Middle Ages, they think about knights. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast to tell us about knights. My pleasure. So let's start at the beginning. When we talk about medieval warriors, what's the difference between a warrior and a knight? What is a knight? A knight is basically somebody who had enough money to afford a horse and equipment, so that meant he was obviously somebody of some standing. It's always going to be tricky when we're talking about knights to give a definitive answer because, as you probably know, knighthood was something that changed through the centuries that we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about several hundred years, so you're going to go from the early days when you've got men on horseback covered in mail. And then you'll come right through to the end of the 15th century when you've got people in complete plate arm, which costs you a fortune. And so you've got very different looking warriors, maybe extremely rich people, including the king, because the king is a knight, right down to the poorest knights, who actually got very little else. So a knight is going to be somebody of a little bit of standing, who's got enough money to afford a horse, because obviously... That's part of the equipment. And the more you've got, the more equipment, the more attendants you've got, the squires, the more horses you can afford. And then you've got the scale, and obviously you've got knights, barons, earls, dukes, kings, all part of the knightly scene, if you like. So I think that something that people ask a lot is, do peasants ever become knights? Or is this something that is completely out of the realm of possibility? Are they always nobles? Or do you sometimes rise up through the ranks to become a knight? At the beginning, it was usually not the done thing. I mean, it, and in some countries, it was very unlikely you would become anything like that in Europe. In some areas, you, you would have to show your nobility of birth but, for example, in England, as time goes on, say 14th century, you can, especially when you've got the Black Death coming through and society changes because so many peasants have died and therefore their worth is more valuable because people need the land to them and therefore they become more valuable. Peasants have got more worth in society. They are becoming a little bit more able to be educated. Some educated peasants can rise through the ranks and they therefore, in time, can become knights themselves. And it does happen. So it doesn't always follow that you've got to be the landed aristocracy to be knights. So yes, you can, not in the early days perhaps, but certainly in the late Middle Ages, you can have knights whose family are from peasant backgrounds. There's hope for us all, exactly. <laughs> and, well, I think that there are a lot of people that are creating medieval fiction, and they want to know if this is a possibility. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned in your latest book, which is The Medieval Knight, is that often people could be knighted on the battlefield either before or after. I always think of this as being maybe not all that kind because, you know, you'd have to all of a sudden be able to afford all the equipment you need to be a knight. But one of the things that you mention is if you were knighted before a battle, that increased your chances of actually being ransomed instead of being killed, right? So what are some of the benefits of knighthood? <laughs> yes, it does. I mean, it does help because 
if you're a knight, you're of a rank, which means you're worth something, as we've said. That means if you're captured, you're of value to your captor because you're going to be worth something to be sold back to the family. Now, it doesn't always follow. Sometimes in battles such as Agincourt, where things are getting very hot, it's not worth keeping the prisoners because the prisoners are in full armour and if things are tight, it means killing the prisoners because you can't afford to have them walking around in full armour even if they haven't got their weapons when you may have them turn on you. And it also happens in England, for example, in the Wars of the Roses in the 15th century, that families use the Wars of the Roses to fight each other to settle old scores. And instead of ransoming prisoners, they kill them because families have taken opposite sides in battles so they can get at each other. So if they take one of them prisoner, they make sure they settle the differences. So it's not always going to be the case that if you are actually taken prisoner, you're going to be safe because you are knighted. There's a case actually at Agincourt where it's the Duke of Brabant arrives late. He makes a sort of coat of arms just by pulling on this makeshift flag, cutting a hole in it and pulling it over his head. Um, rushes into the battle and gets knocked down and captured by an Englishman. And as things turn out, when things go badly for them, the Englishman doesn't think he's of high enough rank because he's got this rather stupid looking coat <laughs> of arms on, which isn't obviously what he would normally be wearing. And so he kills him. Now, if he'd been wearing his proper outfit, he'd probably have survived it because, you know, he'd been one of the really rich people that they would have kept. So, you know, it's not foolproof by any means. <laughs> but um, having said that, yes, you are you are much more likely to survive if you are of some rank like a knight because, yeah, you're, you're going to be worth a ransom. And some people, the higher ranks, such as barons, are going to be worth a lot of money. And then you take someone like Richard the Lionheart, prisoner, and he's worth a fortune. The <laughs> king's ransom. <laughs> king's ransom. But sometimes, you know, if, if the king is making knights on the battlefield, he, you know, it's, it's possible he will pay for the equipment. So it's not always bad to be nice. <laughs> there were times when, yes, people were shunning away from it. In the 13th or 14th century, there was a time when there was a shortage in England. And the kings wanted knights because knights were the people that led troops. So if you don't have enough knights, you haven't got enough captains in charge of leading the the army. So they ordered people to be knighted if they were of a certain degree and they were squires. They, they more or less brought in these laws of distraint, which more or less said you will be made a knight. <laughs> and why they didn't want to become knights? Well, it was becoming expensive. The equipment costs were rising from, say, the time of William the Conqueror. The cost of armour, the cost of horses, the cost of weapons was all going up. Now you had to you had to sit in the courts, you had to go to the shire courts, you had, um, Parliament was starting up in the 13th century and into the 14th century, so you, the, the knights of the shire had to be represented in Parliament. Some people didn't want to do that sort of thing. <laughs> so they just quietly decided, well, I'll, I'll just stay a squire. So in order to get the number of knights they required, the kings would say, if you're of this level, you will become a knight. The ceremony was very expensive, and that was another reason some people didn't want to be knighted at the cost of the ceremony itself. To show yourself to be brave, that was <laughs> a slight problem. Or on the battlefields, and you may have, now being a knight, if you're of a noble family, you have a coat of arms. You've got to show yourself to be brave, because you're not allowed to be seen to be running off somewhere and hiding behind a, a windmill or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've, got to be, you've got to be a brave man, so it's not to everyone's taste. Yes. Well, there's some things about knighthood, I think, that people don't realize and that we we have this idea of chivalry being more than just combat. It has to do with refinement and things okay. like that. So that brings me to people who are raised to become knights. So they start out as boys. Can you tell us a little bit about how they're raised? Because I think people don't realize that being a knight when you're raised to be a knight also involves dance lessons and oh, poetry. Yes. <laughs> Yes. When it first started, of course, being taught to be a knight possibly was just, you know, we're talking about chivalry, presumably, as well. It's all mixed together. And that was really the, the art of horsemanship, cheval, from French. And that was just really being a man on horseback fighting. 
Should we talk about chivalry as well while we're talking about training knights? Because it's all sure. part of the same subject. Yep. This had risen up in southern France because southern France was more settled maybe than the north of Europe. The lords had more money and the ladies of the castle wanted a bit of entertainment. And the minstrels started to give them sort of short stories, short songs about love and the love of the unattainable lady. These were the troubadours who sang of unrequited love, and possibly in some cases adultery. <laughs> These stories then went up north to northern France under the Trouvères, a slightly less rosy hued maybe, and then they were blended with the romance stories, which were the stories of King Arthur's knights and magic and dragons and things like that, which were coming down partly from the Welsh stories all blending together in the romances, which was a mix of passion and chivalry as we are starting to know it now. And again, this was all mixed with the church who wanted to tame these fighting men a bit more, um, bring things like the truce of God, which was you will not fight on certain days of the week, which was a bit of a mixed success. And so that when people were knighted, they would say, well, look, we are going to bless the sword. And then it starts to get a, a meaning to it that the, the edges represented justice and loyalty, and the cross was the cross of the crucifixion. And the brown stockings were the soil that you would return to when you died, and the white robe of purity was what you wore, and the scarlet robe represented the blood of Christ, and so forth. So everything started to take on symbolic meaning, and the church was represented in the nighting ceremony. And you might stand vigil at the altar the night before you were united then you were now seen to be a protector of the church as well as of the weak and of women so that all of this was now part of the ideal that you were now being trained from a young boy to become part of if you're going to be trained to be a knight and not everybody in the family would be thought to be worthy to be a knight obviously the eldest son would be expected to be because he's going to inherit the estates another son might be packed off to be a part of a church because that's good for your soul if you send one of your other sons off to do goodly deeds in the church or monastery or something like that. The younger son's being sent off to maybe a relative's castle or if you're a high rank, maybe the king's court. You would then be taught to be a page and you'd start to learn to serve, you'd be taught how to treat ladies, you'd be taught, as you say, you'd be taught to dance. You'd be taught to groom horses and things like that. And as you start to grow and you start to become of the age where you turn into a squire, and there's no really hard and fast age for this, it's around about the age of 14, you then start to be much more trained in hard knocks. And you're, you're training now with weapons, possibly double weight weapons, so that you build your muscles. And you are trained to, to fight and you're trained to control the stallions, which are pure stallions, these are not uh, gilded, so they've got their fighting spirit. You're trained to ride and you're trained to fight and you go to the hunt with the with the knight because hunting is the nearest thing to fighting the battle. You go to the tournaments with them and you go to battles with them and if they are injured or hurt in the tournament or the battle you have to go in and pull them out of the fighting and it's possible you will be killed but that is your job, you look after the horses and you look after your master. And you look after his armour and equipment and you clean it and you polish it and you get the rust off and you help dress him and you help do everything like that. You're taught to cut the meat that you've brought in, certain ways of cooking it, there's ways of carving and presenting meats. So, like, all these things were taught so that people would be seen to be well-bred. Because they're of this certain rank, they are seen as persons of breeding and quality. But at the same time, they know how to fight. <laughs> but it's a strange sort of mixed balance, isn't it? You are dainty enough to, to dance with a lady in the hall and to carve and things like that, but you were also basically a killer. <laughs> yeah, I think that when people come across stories about knights, the medieval literature itself, it's surprising sometimes. Like Lancelot is fainting all the time. <laughs> He's always fainting. <laughs> Uh, but that was a very knightly thing to do because he was so overwhelmed with love. <laughs> but let's 
let's leave Lancelot alone for a minute. So one of the things that you've done in your career was you were a senior curator at the Royal Armoury Tower of London. So you are really familiar with the type of armor and weapons that knights used. So can you walk us through some of the armor and weapons that knights had and used during the medieval period? Yeah, I mean, it started off as, if we're talking about, say, the Norman Conquest up to about 1300, the commonest protection would be a coat of mail, and so this would cover you from the neck to the, the knee, basically. And most of your arms, by the 12th century into the sort of the end of the 12th century, were covered more or less down to your fingers almost. The rings are uh, made of iron, they're small rings, they're interlinked completely into a male mesh. Each ring is pierced, overlapped, and then closed with a little rivet. And you do that with every single ring. So it's an awful lot of work. So of course these coats were very expensive. It makes it very tough, very difficult to penetrate. They're not particularly heavy. I mean, people sort of pick them up and, and think they are heavy. Well, of course they are heavy if you pick them up as a, as a lump. If you put them on, of course, the weight then spreads. I mean, the, the main part of the weight is on the shoulders because it drags from the shoulders. You can always belt the thing. It's not quite known from the early period so much as the, say, the 12th, 13th century, but you probably have a thick padded tunic on underneath, which is called the Akaton, padded either wool or horsehair or something like that, and then quilted to keep it in place. In itself, a very effective defence. And surprisingly good at stopping arrows, for example. I mean, we've got records in the Holy Land, for example, where you've got infantry trudging along wearing padded tunics in the Holberg, and the arrows are sticking out of them like a hedgehog, and they're all unaffected. So that's the, the major, the, the major type of defence right until then. You've also got a shield of wood. It starts off very large, a big kite shaped wooden shield covered in probably in leather. This gets smaller gradually as the 12th century comes into the 13th century to the shape you imagine a shield to be, if you like. Now, the reason you've got a shield is because mail itself is flexible, because, it, as you know, you can move quite easily. But the trouble is, being flexible, if you get hit, the blow goes into your body. There's nothing to stop the blow being pushed into you. And even if the edge doesn't go into you, there's an awful lot of force, trauma, bump force trauma going into your body, which can break your bones, which is why the padding is there, but it can give you an awfully bad bruise or it can give you a, a very bad trauma. That's why you have this shield. It always sort of amuses me in some of these films where you have the hero with a shield, not using it, <laughs> uh, just fighting away with a sword like this. And you think, I think if this was real, you would want that. But during the 13th century and then much more into the 14th century, you start to see solid plates starting to appear. You start to see little signs of this in the 13th century and on the chest, either as some sort of breastplate. Difficult to see sometimes, but there's something going on. And sometimes you'll see gutter plates or little plates on the elbows and the knees, especially where they're vulnerable, like on these joints around there, because they're solid, they give you protection. And that increases dramatically right through the, the 14th century. So that, say, by the middle of the 14th century, and then it's on to the end of that century, you've got the complete covering of, of plates. And then into the 15th century, you've now got complete plate armour, which is, you know, the shiny knight in armour, which everybody's familiar with. And by that time, they, they've stopped covering themselves with a coat where the plates are, say, underneath the coat. Uh, attached by rivets, and it's now a separate breastplate, and the whole thing is attached to you, and attached to a doublet underneath by um, either by straps or by arming points, which are these twine points which lace the pieces to you. You can you can do it in about ten minutes on the person from head to foot. They used to do it to me. <laughs> we used to get two girls to dress me, two of their uh, staff from the education department. <laughs> and he used to dress me from head to foot in plate armour in 10 minutes. Somebody once challenged us to do it. We used to do like, these half-term dressing sessions in the tower for the public. And we'd show them how you put the armour on from starting at the feet, working your way up to the head. 
And then we take it all off again and we said, you know, you can do this in about 10 minutes really if you've got two, two violets to do it. <laughs> and some um, American who was watching it said, well, go on then, show us. <laughs> I'll time you. And we did. I mean, that was a, a replica, so it's obviously probably not of the high quality you get with the original materials. And some of them obviously were brilliantly made because they were master craftsmen. And they are really, really cleverly made. When, when you actually can see them, you're privileged enough to actually work with the original stuff. Some of the ideas that went into enabling the person to move in it whilst protecting you completely is so clever that you can't really appreciate it unless you can see it in action. Because if you bend your leg or your elbow, as soon as you bend the joints, it opens up gaps between the elbow joint and the arm joints above and below. So what they have to do is put little extra strips to fill that gap, which pivot inside when you move your arm to shut and open. So these little joints spring out and go back in again each time you open and shut that joint. If you want to twist your elbow, which is a, a different movement, you have a rivet which slides in a slot to allow that movement to take place. The helmets from the survivors that um, have come down to us are padded inside, a bit like a modern army helmet, with scalloped padded linings stuffed with horse hair, so it gives you nice padding. And then they have a drawstring so that you can adjust it so that the eye slits of the visor are exactly in the right place every time you put the helmet on. That's and brilliant. Is, and the, the bassinets that you would have worn, say at the time of, well, some of the, the older stars that you've seen at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, or during the later 14th century, which have got these hanging male curtains. The curtain itself is attached to a strip of leather, which is cut with little slits, and the slits fit over these studs, which are pierced, like they're called vervums, along the bottom edge of the helmet. And then you hold them in place over these studs with a little, either a cord or a wire. And then if you want to clean it or repair it, you just pull out the cord and then pull off the thing to clean it. Very clever stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it has to be, right? Because it has to both yeah. keep you alive and oh, yeah. be easy to clean so that yeah. it can keep you alive, you know? Yeah. Breathing holes on the helmets. I mean, on the, um, I don't know if you know these, these what they used to call dog-faced bassinets. I mean, they're, or well, pig-faced bassinets. They're the ones with the slight point that come out to a point. If you look at them, usually you'll find that the, the fewest holes are on the left-hand side because that's the side you present to the enemy. So most of the holes would be on the right-hand side because you don't want a point jamming into that hole and twisting your head around. And you'll find that's mostly the case. On Italian armors, which have very big asymmetric shoulder pieces, the biggest part is on the left-hand side and the smallest one is on the right-hand side. Where things overlap on the left arm going up, they overlap upwards so that anything coming up you doesn't catch, but it skids up from one plate onto the next plate and then away. Brilliantly designed stuff, it really is. I totally agree with you. And I'm just thinking, as somebody that has worked on films like Braveheart, it must drive you crazy to see some of the armor that you, <laughs> you see in <laughs> films. Okay, so some of that has worked on film and TV. What yeah. do you think that we are doing right when we're making nights? And what do you think that we're doing wrong when we're making nights for TV or movies? <laughs> yeah, it's a good start. <laughs> well, it would help if they got the costumes right. There are one or two honourable exceptions where they've done pretty good costuming. For Kingdom of Heaven, they did a very pretty good job on the costuming. I must say, I was very impressed with that. And what was the other one? Outlaw King which is quite recent on Netflix, the, the costume and the armour on that is pretty good for, the, for what it's portraying. But yeah, there are some where you, you sort of look at it and you think, well, they, do, they don't really pay a lot of attention to what you've told them. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go, you, you can tell them what you want and they'll do what they want. <laughs> the problem is, the first thing you see is the visuals, and if that's wrong, I've started to lose interest already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the annoying thing with Braveheart is the story is really watchable, regardless of how inaccurate the whole story is. I mean, like the Battle of Stirling was pivotal because there was a bridge over a river. 
which helped Wallace immensely to win the battle, which is not shown at all. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think that uh, everyone dumps on Braveheart, and it's it's fair in a lot of ways because of things like that. But you're right, it's a very watchable story. (laughs) I mean, it was very cleverly written, and it's very well done in... If you want to be entertained, it's brilliant. <laughs> and I enjoy it when I see it because I just have to shut myself down and just enjoy a film. Um, that's right. That's it. I mean, it, it, you know, even the hanging drawing and quartering was wrong. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't see why why an executioner would wear a mask in the in the heart of England. <laughs> Apart from, I mean, that's just a minor point. But, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't look right if he didn't have a mask, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I did a little story about the um, the heraldry in Braveheart. Which, yeah. Uh, I, I did all the heraldry for Braveheart, some of which was real, because obviously they were real characters. A lot of it wasn't, because uh, a lot of the heraldry was done for characters who were made for the for the parts of them. And one of them was uh, an Englishman called Lord Bottoms. And so I thought, what, what can I do for Lord Bottoms? So I ended <laughs> up giving him a heraldic pile. <laughs> I thought that seemed appropriate. It's perfectly, her- perfectly heraldically correct. So I thought, oh, that's all right. <laughs> so you, you watch it for some of the inside jokes now, too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's interesting that you mentioned Outlaw King because that is one of the ones people ask me sometimes what is a, a movie that is accurate. And Outlaw King, what I pull out of that one, they do have more accurate history than Braveheart, I have to say, but it's the costumes that jump out at me as being some of the more accurate stuff. And I think that's starting to change. Do you think that's true that in movies that are coming out now, people are starting to pay more attention to that kind of detail? Yeah. I've watched The King, you know, the the one about Henry V, which initially I thought, oh, this looks better than some that I've seen. It's not too bad, but obviously if you look at it again and again or still it, then obviously I can pick up (laughs) And Agent Core is a little strange. Yeah. <laughs> like, how would you, how on earth would you recognise Henry V if you didn't know who he was? And if he piles in, you'd, you'd think, who's this bonk? <laughs> <laughs> no, he'd surely have a standard or a banner or something like that. But I think they, have, they are trying a little bit now in some of the films. But you go back to some of the films, I mean, Henry V with Olivia he was visually very good. I mean, some of the scenes, they look like they're out of a manuscript. Yeah. And that's 1944, I think, when that was made. And the Second World War was going on. I think, right, they can do it when the war's on. They do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of, yeah, some of the costumes were a little bit, maybe, when you, if you still the film. But they were pretty good visually, generally, to look at. And then in the 60s, The Warlord with Charlton Heston. For the 1960s, was it was a pretty good portrayal of the Normans. For the period, I mean, it was it was a lot more accurate, say, than Sid, which seems to want to be 13th and 14th century or something like that, when in fact it was roughly the same period as the Warlord. But I don't know, because nowadays there's, there are so many things like Game of Thrones, where you can just do what you like and never <laughs> say anything because it's fantasy. I'm never sure whether that's the way things are going because I think it's on the back of Lord of the Rings and the success of that type of film. It's hard to say. When you've been asked to consult on these things, what is the question that people ask you? So they've brought you on as a consultant. What do they want your help with that they definitely want help with and they just dismiss other things? Well, they don't They don't dismiss it. They just sort of ask for your help. I mean, for, for Braveheart, it was a case of, can you do the heraldry, which is fine. Can you tell us about the sort of armour they would have worn and the, this sort of thing, which I did. We talked about the battle scenes a little bit with one of the people. We were talking about the, the execution scene. How would they have gone to Harley? Would, would they have had a white flag or that sort of thing? Or did they have that type of thing in those days? You know. Whereas when I did the Ivanhoe with the BBC, it was basically, here's the script. Because obviously that was, a, that was a lot closer. It was going and see the production team. Braveheart was more over the case of one or two people coming to the tower. Whereas I went to the BBC for the argument. And uh, I was given the scripts to read through and mark up anything I didn't agree with on the script. 
So that was a different kettle of fish. It wasn't so much that I did the costumes because I didn't really have a say in the costumes. It was, do you agree with how we've done the script on that one? So visually that was nothing to do with me. <laughs> uh, and that one, I suppose, some bits were correct and some bits were not. I mean, it was a, you know, there was one, one nice there was perfectly correct and some others there were two or three hundred years out. Just, <laughs> and they admit they, they don't use everything that you tell them. You yeah. Know, they, they use a, they use a, a tilt barrier. For the jousting, well, they didn't have a tilt barrier until the 15th century. <laughs> they just ran wide. Fought it, but I suppose in, in today's culture, you can't do that. It's too dangerous. In cinematography, you can't you do that and cut it so that you can't see the barrier. <laughs> That's what they wanted to do, so you can't argue. Very nice people. Lovely to meet. <laughs> Yeah. And the other unfortunate thing is, of course, they had joust in the book, where you don't really have joust in, in the period of Ivanhoe. What do you do? Because they're doing a book which is inaccurate itself. <laughs> there, there lies the paradox. What do you do about that? It's totally made up, but it is something that I think brought a lot of people to the field. So good job helping them bring a lot of people to the field, Chris. <laughs> And I'm sure your work at the Tower and your books are doing the same thing, bringing people to medieval knights that maybe didn't know much about them before. So thank you so much for your work, Chris, and thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you. It's been fun. Although Chris doesn't have a website and he's not on Twitter, any quick Google search will turn up his many books. You can find his latest book, The Medieval Knight, on his publisher's website at ospreypublishing.com slash the hyphen medieval hyphen knight. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up this week, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, it's been almost 10 years since Game of Thrones first premiered on our TV screens. And we got a special article from Carolyn Larrington where she talks about how that show impacted and influenced the uh, study of medieval studies. So that's kind of an interesting read to check out. Catherine Walton is here to tell us about the original King Lear. And we have some news about Richard III. It's, uh, if you're a Richard III fan, you're not going to quite like it because it's a little more evidence. We had something to do with the princes in the tower. So just throw another log on that debate. <laughs> yeah, that's a controversial one. Twitter is buzzing about that one. So people can read about it on medievalist.net. Indeed, indeed. So we've got all that. And uh, yeah, I still have articles coming in from the writers and just trying to get, get those out and having a lot of fun. Sounds great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to our patrons on Patreon.com for all your support. Patrons of the Medieval Podcast can hook themselves up with some very cool stuff, like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, membership in our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. To find out more about how to become a patron, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalists. It's that time again. Time for a new session of the Medieval Masterclass for Creators. This is a six-week online course that I developed to help people creating fictional medieval worlds by showing them some of the practical aspects of medieval life. You'll learn about cooking with Beth Rogers, combat with Ken Monshine, blacksmithing with Tom Timbrell, textiles with Katrin Kanya, and daily life with yours truly. You also have the opportunity to connect with other creators for inspiration and motivation. And you also get the chance to ask me anything, anytime. So what are you waiting for? To find out more about the Medieval Masterclass for Creators, please visit MedievalMasterclass.com. The next session begins March 5th. For everything from knights to knaves, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a wonderful day. <laughs>